Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dave Stump, ASC. I'm a member of the uh, Academy SciTech Sci Council, and I'm here to talk to you about the Solid State Lighting Project, which is uh, um, a study on the spectral sensitivity indexes of LED lights. So we, a few years ago, started to see that there was a problem in terms of how do we judge the quality and spectrum and usefulness of LEDs for motion picture lighting. Because motion picture lighting is very, very specific with specific primaries and spectral sensitivities in cameras. Uh, and uh, it's pretty easy to recognize that CRI, color rendering index, is insufficient to the task because it's just sort of a general color temperature average. Uh, the eye and film and digital cameras all see color differently. Uh, and lamp spectrum affects skin tone, makeup, costumes, props, sets, and as you will learn in a second or so, color charts very profoundly. So you can see uh, sort of, let me see how this looks on the screen out here. Oh good, it looks good. Uh, you can never tell how these screens are gonna react. <clears throat> you can see a little bit of the difference here between incandescent lighting and LED lighting. So here are some color rendering indexes on some of the different uh, qualities of lights. Uh, a CRI of 50 to 70 is a fair number. 70 to 80 is a good number. 80 to 90 is an excellent number. But CRI is not sufficient for the purposes of photography. <clears throat> As we've been seeing in other presentations, I've been watching, uh, most white LEDs have poor color rendering index due to peaks and troughs in spectrum. Lower energy at a wavelength equals a darker color than incandescent. It's, it is hard to predict color problems from published data. Now, one thing that I carry in my kit, and I got this at Amazon.com. I think this is about a eight or nine dollar tool, and it's an ISCO spectroscope. So if you want to carry this in your kit, you can point it at any source and see whether you've got continuous spectrum or partial spectrum very, very quickly and easily. And it's, it's not an easy tool to, to, do, to make fine uh, definitions about color, but it pr can pretty quickly tell you whether you've got a problem or not in your spectrum. If there are big gaps in the spectrum of a lamp, this thing will tell you immediately. Um, at the Academy, uh, we have the Esmeralda test easel, and it was designed going clear back to the 80s, 70s and 80s, as a test stand for testing film stocks and cameras and colorimetry of all kinds. Uh, it was at Apogee Productions back in the day, and we did all kinds of academy studies and all kinds of colorimetry studies, and we worked with Eastman Kodak, and it's a pretty thorough test bed. And one of the tests that we have uh, in the Esmeralda setup at the Academy um, Pickford Center is what we call a split Macbeth. Now, I don't know if you can see well enough on this screen to see what it is, but it's a foreground, uh, smaller, um, Macbeth chart that has half height uh, square patches and the other half of the patch, the top half of each patch is cut out so that you can see through the chart and you can see back to another larger Macbeth behind it and these two charts are lined up so that if you had even and continuous spectrum on the illuminant for the foreground chart and the illuminant for the background chart you wouldn't be able to distinguish that it was two charts. Does everybody get that? So you see one chart through the other, and this gives us the capability to light one chart with different illuminance than the other chart. 
And the result is, and this is offset a little bit so that you can actually see that this is through the split Macbeth, what the color rendition is, what the index is for all of the patches for two different illuminants, the bottom half being the foreground illuminant and the top half of each patch being the background illuminant. And it's a great way to quickly identify where to look in the spectrum. So from these studies, we created uh, an open source piece of software called the Academy Color Predictor, uh, from which we can examine and analyze a split Macbeth chart to sort of give you an idea what any kind of illuminant is going to give you out of uh, a split Macbeth setup. And if you, if you look here, you can see the color response um, of this particular illuminant, which is probably not a very good one. <laughs> but can everybody see? I, again, I got to look and see what this is doing on this set. Yeah, it's, that's a pretty accurate idea of what, what the kind of thing is that we expect to, to see or not see out of a split Macbeth analysis. So what we determined a few years ago is that the, there were no st standard spectrum to use uh, for predictable camera response. A typical solid state lighting spectrum does not render the same colors for different cameras or film. And typical spectrum does not render the same colors for cameras and for the eye. And the useful thing to know about this spectrum is that if you are shining a light at, for example, a human face, and the light is deficient in a color, then you can't accept to, uh, expect to see any return of that color to the camera. And there is something funny about flesh tones if you don't supply them with the kind of quality of color that we're used to seeing. And you can, you can always or usually sense when deficient spectrum is being used for photography. <clears throat> so in this case, the upper halves are tungsten light. CRI has proven very uh, insufficient to quantifying LED lights. LED color quality normally given by color rendering index is just a very broad measurement. CRI value indicates how close colors will appear to the eye to those made by incandescent lamps in terms of Kelvin color temperature. And CRI assumes a human standard observer for colors seen by human eyes. Digital cinema cameras don't have the spectral sensitivity of other di digital cameras or film or of the eye. They, they all see colors differently. Different digital cinema cameras can render different colors for the same scene. CRI does not accurately predict the colors produced by digital cameras and film. Most existing color indices Assume a CIE 1931 standard observer. Does everybody know what the CIE 1931 was, is? Wow, not very many, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, it was a, a series of experiments conducted in 1931 to quantify human perception of color. What colors can human beings see and how do we measure them and how do we quantify them? Uh, film and digital cameras have different spectral sensitivities than human eyes. Uh, the Television Lighting Consistency Index, TLCI, assumes a particular digital camera spectral sensitivity based on averages of many video cameras. And you can see the two graphs here. Uh, what those averages, how those averages were derived from multiple cameras. Uh, they're turned into 
averages smoothed and rebalanced. Uh, that is still not specific enough to quantify uh, narrow spectrum emitters. TLCI assumes a REC 709 rendering rather than a P3 digital cinema color gamut. Uh, digital cinema cameras don't have the spectral sensitivity of the TLCI camera. New digital cinema cameras often have new spectral sensitivities. And we've been hearing a number of speakers talk about that. Um, some cameras borrow more light from infrared, others borrow less light from infrared to make their reds, which is why we frequently have to use specific IR cutoff filters for specific digital cameras. So it's really important to test every camera with every um, cutoff filter so that you match the two correctly. Um, nearly all indice indices assume either a CIE standard observer or a defined camera response. Rendered colors not consistent for cameras uh, with differing spectral sensitivities uh, becomes an issue for us. So we, we wanted to try to quantify uh, the output of these emissive LED sources independent of specific cameras and independent of human vision. The Spectral Similarity Index, or SSI, is an index for evaluating luminaires used for motion picture photography, but also for, for television and still photography and human vision. A single number on a scale up to 100 indicates the similarity of a spectrum of a test illuminant to a reference illuminant, typically incandescent or daylight, the two standard illuminants that, that evolved human vision, uh, and in our cases, uh, negative values are possible, because if you look at the CIE, there are negative values. Um, the SSI can be thought of as a, as a confidence factor that rendered colors will be as expected. Now, Anecdotally, values about 90 or above should be very good. Between 80 and 90 are pretty good, and below 60 uh, on the scale will have some issues. SSI considers wavelengths from 380 to 670 nanometers, with less contribution to the value from wavelengths at the low and high ends of the spectrum. Low energy spikes and noise are smoothed out during the calculation. Values are typically a lower value than CRI to allow more precision in the range of interest. So what's next for the SSI? Uh, we've conducted a number of experiments and tests. We've done a pretty thorough job of quantifying this. The math is rock solid and has been vetted. Uh, so now we're proceeding to validate SSI for production use. We actively encourage light meter manufacturers to implement SSI in their manufacture to enable broad field use. And once validated, we are proposing it for SMPTE standardization. After we finish the SMPTE process, uh, we're going to propose it for ISO standardization. The SSI calculator Excel, as an Excel worksheet for one nanometer and two nanometer spacing is available at this URL. More information will be appearing on www.oscars.org and you can also contact us directly at SSI at Oscars.org. Thank you very much. Nice to see so many of my good friends here today.